I'm going to hand it over to Alvaro. Oh, cool. Okay, give him a round of applause. Hello, everybody. Again. Yes, cool. Okay, so um, thank you. I have it here. So uh, my name is Alvaro. I'm a production engineer at Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about System D. Why should you care as a Python developer? Or another way to see this is a gentle introduction to System D for Python developers, which I gladly I am one of those. Um, this is going to be like half a talk, maybe a quarter of a talk of the one that I did at PyCon. Um, so if you like this, please go and watch that video. Um, cool. So let's start. First of all, how many of you have interacted with System D or know what System D is? Great. Cool. So that's that's great. Okay. Cool. So let's get started. So System D is a service manager, right? So we have to ask ourselves, what is a service manager? So a service manager, it's basically something that should manage your service. That means that system D is not UWSG, it's not Django, it's the thing that makes Django run. So in, in your service manager, you will define operations, like start, stop, and also if you have your Django application that needs to start slightly after your Postgres application is already on, is your service manager the one that it's supposed to do this? When I ask about uh, system D, let me ask a different question now. Who here feels good about system D? Cool. Who here, who here have heard like bad things about system D? Cool. Awesome. Kind of half and half. So before system D, what some people would call the good old days, you were your own service manager. There were no framework for this. You have to write everything for you. And you do that by writing shell script. And people think that writing shell script is a great thing because basically you can do whatever you want, but actually it's a bad idea because you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so uh, for instance, let me explain like this. This is uh, the Cassandra uh, init script that is directly from the GitHub repository. And that line over there that are, that are in white are the start part of the script. Now, the only line that actually start the service is the line 110. Everything else is supposed to handle uh, argument parsing, which is something that, why would you do that? And also, you are handling um, like verbose output and all the things that you have to do. Um, so basically, you do a lot of boilerplate code and you type a lot of things. So it was obvious for the Unix and Linux community that System 5 was really good, but it came to a point where it didn't serve us anymore. Uh, so a few replacements happened, uh, or a few replacements were proposed. The first one was Upstart, which was <laughs> proposed by Debian, so more, more by Canonical. It was really adopted by Debian. And then uh, System D was proposed by Leonard, adopted by Red Hat. And they went into a little war, and as everything happened in this industry, one won, and that one was System D. Basically, all major distribution use System D. And that is kind of the spirit of this talk. It doesn't matter if you like it or you hate it. It's basically, System D is a fact of life now. It's part of your system. So why don't we better like take real advantage out of it? OK, so what sets System D apart from any other in its system it's that basically you don't tell him what you don't tell him how to do things. You tell him what you want him to do. So where you used to have shell script, now you have unit files, and this is a service file in particular. Here, this file is not executable at any point. You just define what is your service, how it's composed, and how would you start it, and then you will let System D do it for you. So. This is the first change of paradigm. It's basically it's that you don't start your service. You ask System D, can you start my service? In this case, it's a UWC. You say, systemctl, start my service. You can tell him, hey, can you stop it? And this is kind of the most important thing, or what I believe is what made System D kind of won the war, is that since is System D the one that starts your service and you handle control to him, uh, or to it, um, it can give you a lot of information about your service. The first one is, is my service running? 
And you would thought that it was easy to find, but before system D, this was actually not that easy. You then, it can tell you how long has been running since he's the one that actually made the first like fork exec on your project. Uh, he can tell you. Also, it can tell you which process belong to your service and do all this through C groups. So, this would not be a really good systemd talk if I didn't talk about two things, C groups and socket activation. Who here is familiar with at least one of those two? Great, I really love talking here. So, C groups. C groups is a Linux kernel feature that allows you to uh, impose limits or restrictions on your service. So you can say, for instance, my application can only use like one gigabyte of RAM. And then systemd, or sorry, or the Linux kernel, not systemd, will ensure that that is the way that it goes. You can tell him use 20% of CPU or only connect to these IPs and everything is handled by the kernel. Systemd uses C groups in a slightly different way. The way that it uses is that it uses to kind of have names for services. So systemd will start a C group every time that you ask to start your service and it will start your process. So here's the thing. If now your process start like two child process, imagine that that is Django and those two child process are Django workers that are the ones that actually are serving your web requests. So if you see those processes there are part of the process tree of your, of your service. So if you want to know which child is the main process, you just walk the process tree and you have them. But what if one of these processes decide to double fork itself and then became a daemon? It will no longer be part of the process tree. But since systemd starts everything in a C group, and every service has its own C group, you basically have a way to identify them all. So this comes, this actually gives us a really nice solution for this, because previously you could not actually kill a service in a way that was reliable. So who here remember the old times when we have Apache web servers, and those Apache web servers have CGI running on them? And then in one of the CGI, it double fork itself, then it escaped the Apache, and then you restart Apache and everything goes away, except the service. And then the services stay hostage on your machine, hacking resources, and you have no way of finding out. With systemd, everything is stuck in a C group. And basically, um, basically when, when you want to kill something, you just kill the C group and, and Linux kernel takes care of that. So, that was kind of the gentle introduction to what systemd is. I will now show two examples of how things that you can do with systemd, and I will show a library, and we will be on our way home. So, templates. A cool thing that you can do with systemd is that instead of starting your service as my app.service, you can put an aroba or an app symbol in your name. And then in your unit file, you define this little percentage i. So then when you start your service, you can actually say, hey, start my app at a word. Doesn't matter that word. Then your service will start, and everywhere that you saw that percentage y, it will get replaced by that conf or by that word. What this means that if, for instance, if you have your application and you have two different applications and the only difference is the configuration that they use, you can use this mechanism to actually have one unit file and then have a way to start. This actually is a little bit cooler because if you have just one application and the add, the thing that you put after the add is the version of your application that can be like the path to your system where the source is, you can actually handle upgrades like this. So you can do my app at version one, that start, then my app at version two, do your A-B testing, verify that the second version is working and then you stop the first one. That is, if, of course, if you have the memory to have twice your service running. Cool. And then socket activation. Okay. So socket activation, it's, before talking to that, let's see how a normal system works. So you have your application that eventually will open a port. This port will be a file descriptor from your application. So you have this little workflow where you start your application and eventually it will open a port and you will get a request. Then you will send that response back and then everything is happy. There's an implicit here, like an, an implicit thing here, and that is that if your application is down, then there's nothing to get your requests. 
So that means that if somebody sends you a request, you will not be able to serve it. Socket activation work changed this workflow a little bit. Instead of you being the one that start your, your application and start listening, you ask, System D, can you start listening to that port? Then a request will flow, and only when the request flow, System D will start your application, and then will hand, handle the file descriptor to your app, and then you can send the request back. So this actually gives you like a lot of possibilities besides the obvious one that you are thinking. The first one that it's giving you is that you can start your serve your port as root, right? I imagine that everybody here renamed his root user as Guido, right? <coughs> cool. So I do that, at least. It, it hasn't brought me any problems, by the way. Okay, um, and then you can make your application run as another user. And since your application doesn't have to care about the port that it's using, because you handle the file descriptor, that is literally just a file on your file system, um, you can make all these things work, and your application can run as the small user instead of running as the root user. And this is cool because what you will normally do is that you will start your application as root, and then eventually you will drop privileges. Here, you never had those privileges. So that is one thing. The other thing that is cool is that since you don't have your port, sorry, you don't have your service started, um, imagine that you have your dev, your dev box, your, your laptop, and you are working on an application that uses a database. But you don't actually need to have your MySQL running all the time. You just spin it up when you need it. And how do you do that? Because you just make a simple MySQL request, and then the kernel or system D will handle all these things. And this is actually the reason why we have boot up that takes like, you can boot your machine or your Linux machine in what? 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Basically, you start everything at the same time and just let the sockets activate the applications that you need when you need them. So, going a little bit forward, you can take this idea and use this for the version upgrades. So, you have your application, you started with version one, as I explained, and then if you use an option in the Linux kernel that is called SO port reuse, you can actually start a second your second version of your application and both will be listening to the port then let the linux kernel will do the load balancing for you uh, you will do your a-b testing decided that the a second application is good enough to be called the main application and you can slowly kill the one the, and let the two be the one and this is how you can do rollouts without losing any connection why do i say without losing any connection because the one who does the the listen on the socket on the socket is system D. So he's the one that is listening. Your application is only doing the accept. And as we know that you cannot interrupt an accept. So that is cool. Okay. I will just show how this is done and then I will open for questions if anybody has. Okay. So this is done. Instead of having a service unit, you can also have a socket unit where you define all the things that you want. In your Python code, this is how you used to do it. Like you open a socket, you bin to a port, and then you listen into it. But since now you don't listen into it, you just start your socket from a file descriptor. So that file descriptor is handled by you by systemd, and then you just open that, and then it's you just do assets. For handling all of this, we at Facebook and the lead author of this, we created a Python library that handle all these magic things for you. And it talks to systemd through Vivas. Um, so for instance, if you want to, you can import it like that. You can take any service and then you can start it or you can stop it with just an API call without having to chill out to it. If you want to get like information, the same information that you got, you do like, you call the property and you will get an integer and not a string that you need to parse. Uh, because this all talks about in over Divas, and Divas is a type system. And you can get all the information that you want through your Python service. So you can actually manage your service through Python. Um, on PyCon, when I did this presentation, the thing that followed up, which by, the, by now we don't have time for it, was a, person, was a demo on how you can actually start services. Like, you can make systemd start your application and then block all the network access for your application and just, for instance, allow it to ping a port. 
So you have an, a secure application and all those things. I would really recommend go and see that if you care about this. And yeah, that's it. Cool. So, Questions? Yes. Questions from the bottom? Yes, I have a mic. Question in the back. Oh, cool. I, it's always cool because people don't usually ask questions about this. <laughs> so this wanna... is why I really like this topic. <laughs> Go ahead. You can shout it. I can repeat it. If. Oh, is it now? Can you hear me? All right. So if I want to set a socket option, mm -hmm. uh, normally I would do that via code. How do I do that? Sorry, again, I didn't understand. If I want to set an option on a socket that I open. Yes. What option in particular? So, so, sorry. So all those options that you have, like for instance, the SO port reuse or the SO address reuse or bin to an address that you don't own, like that is those, all those options that you have on the socket, those are all specified on the socket file. And, they, and everything that the kernel, in, sorry, anything that you can do on the kernel, you can literally specify as a, as, a, as an option. I don't have it here because I'm lazy when I write examples, but um, so here, this in this unit file where it says socket, you there you specify and then you can literally put like all your kernel options. Um, sorry that I cannot show you, uh, but if you are interested on this uh, and somebody ever gets you my email, send me an email and I can send you all the links and example for this. Cool. Ah, it's working now. Oh. More questions. More questions about system D. Running containers. Maybe you just want to compliment the very tasteful transitions that Alvaro used during his presentation. Oh yeah, they were nice. Yes. Right, Nick, here you go. Um, just a little bit of a random question here, but do you have any idea why they use this like at and then argument syntax instead of just add an argument? Okay, so um, the idea of the of these files in particular is that they are just files on your file system. That is kind of the idea. So that you can mount any file system and there are no APIs. You just read file system and then you do it. So you need to have like a specification on exactly what to, uh, like where would your run, where your variable will start. And the reason why you only have one at the system, at the, uh, like the only, the only reason why you can only have one at and then one thing at the other end, it's because the whole point of this is that you don't do crazy stuff uh, when you are defining your service. The whole point of this is that if I just look at your file, I know which user is running your application. If I go and look into my Cassandra uh, init script, I have no idea how even Cassandra gets started. I just have to trust it. Oh, I can be smart and read it, but who has time for that? But, uh, but yeah, so so that's that's kind of the thing. Uh, all this is like the mainly list for systemd. It's really open and it's friendlier than one thought. At least it was friendlier than most peps five seven two comments that I wrote. <laughs> okay, now let's know in there. Sorry, you, you, you had a question. All right, was there a question in front here? So is it possible to hook this up to um, system preferences on a Mac? So like uh, on a Mac, you can use like Apache CTL to start Apache, but then you also can set a system preference pane to make a nice shiny button you can use to do that. Can you make shiny buttons in system preferences and use this? Yeah, so uh, I will answer that in two, in two rows. Sorry for not giving a straight answer right away. So system D can only run in Linux. Like cannot run on BSD, cannot run on Mac, cannot run on Windows because it relies heavily on uh, more than heavily. So we're like it's fundamentally tied to Linux C groups. Can it run in uh, Raspbian or, D or Debian? Yes, oh. because those are Linux. Those are Linux kernel, even though the the um, um, the processor is different. But and it actually does. Like Raspbian use uh, uh, System D as default. Uh, that was the first question. And the second thing, can you do shiny buttons with this? Most definitely. The whole point of this is that you have APIs. Even though you cannot run systemd on 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 a Mac, systemd is inspired heavily by launch CTL on on Mac. 
or launch the, I can't remember what is the name, but the whole concept of socket activation and the stuff P list that you have, it's, it's like the idea what really inspired, uh, sorry, it really inspired them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah. Thank Great you guys for the question. Thank yeah. you guys for listening to me. Make sure.